Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, session of uh, Diplomat Diaries. Uh, we are very privileged and honored to have with us um, Excellency uh, Philip Ackerman, Ambassador of Germany to India. Uh, and as, you can, as we can see, a full house. Uh, I think Germany-India relations have never been this sexier. Uh, so all thanks to, thanks to uh, our ambassador here. Um, excellent, uh, uh, we, uh, excellent times for India-Germany relationship. But I, I also think that uh, uh, there is much to talk about what, 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 what has happened in just in the last 24 hours in Germany. <laughs> Um, and elsewhere. And elsewhere. Um, and, uh, but I think just even without that, India-Germany uh, story was, uh, was, uh, has been doing very well. Uh, and with the Chancellor's visit recently, we have uh, lots of things on the agenda, which we actually, when, we, when you look at India-German relation, where they were and where they are today, uh, the arc of that relationship has really been transformative in the last few months. Uh, so we look forward to uh, to this interaction, to uh, to the remarks, uh, and we'll open this up for for your questions, comments, observations later on. But first, uh, Ambassador, welcome, and over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for being so uh, interested in Germany. I'm very impressed that you know we announced it on Monday only, so I'm I'm very um, happy to see so many um, interested faces here. Um, I hope that it is because of the intergovernmental consultations and not because of the fellow of the German government yesterday, but I'm very happy to talk about that also. Um, but let me start by saying that I just, today, two hours ago, I came back from Mumbai where, um, where I met with the whole executive board of the, you know, the biggest German bank, Deutsche Bank, which you all know. Deutsche Bank um, has, uh, the, the executive board in its totality came to Mumbai in order to announce a um, 50 crore euro investment in Deutsche Bank India, um, because Deutsche Bank believes that, um, you know, adding to their capital stock in India would be good for financing industrial growth in India. So it basically a strong commitment to, to their business in India. Deutsche Bank has been in India for a long time and is, is, is very, very, um, bullish about what happens in India and, and wants to expand their business. And the day before that, I went to, um, to Bangalore on, on Tuesday night, where the whole executive board and supervisory board of the German IT giant SAP met. And SAP will um, open a, a new campus in Bangalore. Um, uh, SAP has 15,000 engineers working already in Bangalore, and they will uh, expand that for another couple of thousand engineers. This is more personnel than they have in Germany proper, where their headquarters is. And also they very much um, you know, feel that this is the place to be for their further uh, business expansion. And I just wanted to give you these two, two examples. They are very significant about how Germany thinks um, uh, about India in the, in the years to come. Um, there is a clear shift when it comes to Germany um, and India, uh, towards India. And that is government as well as non-government. So I gave you just two examples um, of businesses who do, you know, who do very well here, who make a lot of money in India. And we had uh, 10 days ago um, the biannual um, Asia Pacific conference of the German business, of the German private sector, a biannual exercise that is rotating through Asia. But this, this year it was in Delhi with a thousand delegates from the German business and elsewhere. And where also the, you know, the emphasis was on how interesting the development in India is and how uh, you know, people are quite impressed with what happens in India and how people are looking more and more in investing and expanding their business in India. So that was very, I think that was very um, uh, good to see that, you know, India has a new weight. Now, why is that so? First and foremost, because India has, uh, you know, very in a very impressive growth rate and India has a very good story when it comes to business development but also because of geopolitics we know that um, there is another elephant in the room China um, and uh, the German government is encouraging uh, its business to de-risk as we call that um, um, so we say you know our mistake in the past has maybe been that we put too much too many eggs in one basket and we now have to look for other shores and 
and India comes to mind very quickly. This is uh, you know, one of the most interesting markets with this growth rates for the years to come. So I guess the, the, the message of this conference was look closer, look more um, actively to, towards India and at India as a potential uh, place to, to invest. So next to that, we had um, um, the intergovernmental consultations. Now, that's a very unique format. I think India has it with no other countries, and we have it with some European countries and in Israel. But for the rest, it's only India with, with whom we have that. Since about 15 years, every second year, either the prime minister with ministers of his cabinet travel to Germany, or the German chancellor with ministers of his cabinet travel to India. And this um, October, we had the German chancellor and eight ministries coming to to India. Um, and the fact is that these ministries then met, meet their counterparts. They discuss um, common projects, common um, um, engagements, common ideas. And then in a plenary session, these ideas are put together in a roadmap for the uh, next two years. And I think that these were very, very successful uh, intergovernmental conversations. We signed about 30 MOUs and letters of intent. We had a, a it's very granular. I will not bore you with the, uh, the little, little things, but it shows you know how uh, deep the relation has become and how um, you know detailed we, uh, we we work together in in a good way. Um, I think we consider these I, IGC um, a big success, and so does the Indian side. Indian. Uh, side was extremely forthcoming, very hospitable, and, and very interested in the matter. So this is really hands-on work. Um, for the embassy, it's a nightmare, frankly, because you have to run eight parallel programs and the chancellor and this business conference at the time. But we managed well, and now in hindsight, we would say we have, we have um, generated a good result. And the third element, and this is maybe the newest of all these elements, is that once these IGC were over, the chancellor and the foreign minister traveled to Goa. Why? Because in Goa, there was a German frigate coming with a big uh, combat provi provision ship. Um, they had exercised with the Indian Navy um, on the East Coast and the West Coast. And they, the, it was sort of their final port call after a tour through the world where they, you might have followed that, also crossed the um, Strait of Taiwan. And Goa was their last um, big port call before going back to Germany. And that was also very important because what in these IGC became so graspable, palpable, was that Germany wants to be more and more a um, stable and reliable security partner for India. So we had this Tarang Shakti exercise in August where the German Air Force came with 10 planes to Coimbatore and exercise with the, German, uh, the Indian Air Force for the first time. Um, and now we have the frigate coming. That's the second time. Two years ago, there was another frigate coming. But we clearly want to support Indian, the Indian armed forces in their, uh, you know, development in their also force of deterrence. Um, we are very much engaged in the Indo-Pacific, and we feel that the Indian approach to the Indo-Pacific is exactly matching ours. And that also, this is a delicate um, element, but I'm happy to talk about it. That also leads to a, a renewed policy of when it comes to arms or defense production procurement from Germany. So um, there was always a bit of a discontent when it comes to the Indian side um, about German procedures that were very slow, you know, approval procedures, and that has stopped completely. So we have changed our. Um, our system towards India. And that all, everything um, which I'm describing now comes together in a paper, which is also unique, which is called Focus on India. It's a paper the, the German government has, um, you know, worked on during the last month. It was a very, you know, comprehensive interagency process. And um, the, the result is really, uh, you know, uh, putting in words what the German government has done over the last two years which coincided with my tenure, but certainly not uh, is uh, certainly not the cause for this for this um, shift in policy. That you know we want to um, put the Indo-German relation on the next level. And what you have seen, I call it the German Mahotsav. Um, in the last couple of, of weeks, is basically the expression of this um, this desire or this uh, sort of intention or uh, political uh, yeah uh, political. Uh, 
commitment towards, towards a partner, which used to be a strategic partner for a long time, but now we have really reached another level. And I think that is welcomed by the Indian government in a very, very nice way. So I think the Indian government has understood that there is a, a big shift towards India in our policy. Now, that sounds wonderful and diplomatically all right, but that still, um, <laughs> there's still the fact that yesterday after the election result in the US, the German government um, imploded, one has to say so. Uh, the chancellor uh, uh, sacked the finance minister, and this is a clear step towards early new elections. German government, we have three parties, the Social Democrats, strongest party, then the Green Party, and the small Liberal Party. They had four ministers, and during the last couple of months, uh, the Liberals and the Greens, but also the Social Democrats, did not agree on how to uh, proceed on mainly economic and fiscal reforms. And it was, um, um, it became worse and worse. Elections were due in September next year, um, so basically it's not even a year from now. But um, you know, putting the brakes or putting the foot on the brakes a little earlier makes it now in March. We will vote. The German will German people will vote um, and elect a new government in March next year. So being German, everything is sorted out already. So <laughs> we have two laws that have to go through Parliament. We'll see whether that works because government has not the majority anymore. At, on 15th of January. There will be a confidence, a vote of confidence. You know, the chancellor will ask whether she still, he still have, has the, she still has the confidence of, uh, as his government still has the confidence of, of the German Bundestag, the Parliament. The answer will be no because the Liberals will not vote for him. Everybody knows that the answer will be no. Then the federal president will dissolve the Parliament um, and will ask for or will call for new elections, and that will be March next year. So basically, six months before the actual date. Now I'd say that so. In such a detailed way, you know, we have a system that is um, intrinsically stable. So there is no uh, volatility in the system. We have had so bad experiences with the volatile system during the Weimar Republic between the two world wars that our constitution and our institutions are set up in a way that everything, even an implosion of an early implosion of a government, is, is uh, you know reacted by or followed by a very very. Uh, set up standard procedure, so stability will be guaranteed. I would say by now that we'll have a, a new government uh, with a new chancellor um, in, in March. But you know, from here to then, to, till then, things can also change. Um, the, the coalition was not popular with the German people, and and I think um, we, we we might see a, a new chancellor. But what I'm um, what I'm very sure of is that that. Um, strategic uh, approach to India and the uh, sort of this, this next level um, partnership will com will be taken up by any government. So there is, in foreign policy, there is a bit like in India actually. Um, there is between the opposition and the ruling party. There is never b a big difference. Uh, so um, I think uh, we can be completely sure that this shift towards India, the focus on India paper will be um, taken up by a new government, whoever may be part of it, um, in the same way. So I'm, I'm completely um, convinced that, um, that this, will con this partnership between Germany and India will continue. Now, there is another event yesterday which um, will keep us busy for the next four years. That's the election of Donald Trump um, in an you know, unforeseen, uh, clear victory. I think um, I would have said he had the best chance to win, but I would never have thought it was with such a clear margin. Yeah. Um, that is a big challenge for Europe, and especially Germany. Um, and maybe the government also felt it would be appropriate to have a new majority in the parliament in order to face that challenge. So the chancellor, I think, might have played a role in his decision to, to call the government off yesterday. Maybe I stop here, and then we'll open up. Is, is that fine? Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador. It was uh, uh, wonderful to hear from you, the, the drivers of, uh, of, uh, uh, of India-German um, momentum in, in India-German relationships. Uh, and you laid, they laid, them, laid them out very clearly, uh, of course, uh, the structural factors, uh, and, but also in, in some ways a reorientation of, of, of Germany uh, towards the Indo-Pacific uh, and, and its own 
uh, attempts to uh, carve out uh, its own space in the global order, which is uh, which is a significant development in and of itself. Uh, and and India and German really Indo-German relations have been a beneficiary of that of that transformation as well. Uh, I think uh, in in uh, you know um, I, I will have a few uh, sort of uh, observations and questions to basically to you. Um, you know, you you ended with Mr. Trump and him his victory. Perhaps uh, reflecting on that, um, uh, it was interesting uh, that in, in I think one of the initial responses uh, to to Donald uh, to Mr. Trump's victory, uh, we saw uh, President Macron calling for uh, greater engagement uh, among Europeans. Mm. And I think if you can speak to that, that how uh, how does Germany look at this uh, this moment in France and France's relations? Uh, where uh, there is there has always been this concern about strategic autonomy, and now with Mr. Trump coming to office, what might the contours look like? It's hypothetical, but I think important from European perspective also to move in which direction, because it also implicates the other question of Ukraine. You know, where where does it go now from here, and how and how do you look at uh, the end game, uh, perhaps, and, and then of course the larger uh, European security architecture emerging out of this very particular moment in, in European security. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, mm. I think, um, is, that, is that better? Better? Okay. So uh, we have had our experience with Trump one. Um, one can say, I mean, you have to start by saying um, it is an overwhelming victory for him. He has been democratically elected. There hasn't been not reported one, uh, you know, uh, how to say, uh, election problem or something. Everything seems to be very well. I mean, like the Americans do vote. So... Uh, there is, it goes without saying that, you know, Europe will recognize this president as the legitimate and, and uh, president of the United States and we will work with him, you know, as Europe and the Americans are allies like nobody else in the world. I mean, we are intertwined, interwoven in, in, a, in a unique way. And the, basically the glue of this is NATO. Um, so we know that President Trump has a, a very transactional <laughs> Uh, approach to NATO saying that, you know, he feels that the U.S. are paying too much for NATO. And, you know, maybe over the last couple of years, you have to give him, uh, to say that, that he has a point also, that the Americans have been the biggest shield and many European countries, uh, you know, stayed hidden behind the shield and did their little thing, but was, were basically relying on the on a very strong um, U.S. Um, armed forces um, and, and military power. Um, I think we have, we are all prepared for a, um, a, a president who comes again and will say, we are still paying too much, although um, my country, for example, and others have increased their military budget considerably. So um, you might remember that Trump last time said, last in his last tenure said, we need 2% of the GDP spent for, for military. And, um, and we were at 1.3 or something at that time. And now um, we are at two, uh, but now he says three or even more. And I think that's a, a requirement or a, that's a, a demand which, with which we have to, to work. Um, and I think in this context, you'll see um, a growing European movement for getting your act together in Europe and trying to find ways and means to, to come to a strategic autonomy, as you call it. So that means basically investment into armed forces and joining also hands in armed forces. You know that Europe is, the European Union is 27 countries, and some of them are very small. And still everybody has their own army and um, you know, one should, should think, isn't it time now to think in a more European um, framework? I think um, my government has said, my, my foreign minister has said the same thing, said, you know, this will lead to a renewed engagement within the European Union um, to do more for defense and strategic autonomy. It's inevitable. And then, you know, as in diplomacy, they say, never waste a crisis. Maybe this is the moment where Europe really can find its role and, um, and its um, military power. Ukraine, um, you remember that President has said, the President Trump, the President elect Trump, I should say, has said that he will solve the issues, issue in one day, he says, you know. Um, 
So there were jokes in the German newspaper saying that he solved the, the problem of the German coalition in one hour, they say, you know, because it imploded. <laughs> but, but I have my doubts whether he will be able to solve it in a day. We are of the opinion that um, peace in Ukraine is paramount, it's very important. The war has to stop. We have to find ways and means to, um, to come to a peace, but the peace must be fair and just. And the Ukrainians must have a big say in this peace. You know, it can't be a diktat peace. You know, it can't be a peace that the Russians say, we take a third of your country and you will never be part of a military alliance. That's not the reflecting the Uk Ukrainian will, basically. So we are looking forward to see what the a new administration in Washington has to offer for this peace. President Trump seems to have an idea. Um, but, you know, our um, fun, fundamental belief is that if we come to negotiations, these negotiations must be fair and on an equal footing. Um, the Russians say we will negotiate with Ukraine alone. This is not an equal footing. You know, there, there is one big and strong partner and one weak partner. So I think our, you know, the European point of view, um, and that, you know, I, is valid as as well for the current government in Germany, as well for the opposition, or the stronger conservative opposition, is that we will support the Ukrainians as long as necessary. Um, we will be very happy if um, uh, peace negotiations will start under circumstances which are acceptable for both sides. But until then, and we don't see right now any you know, sign or hint that these negotiations will take place in this framework. Until then, we feel that we should support Ukraine in its legitimate fight to keep its territory. And um, so that is, in a way, linked to the strategic autonomy of Europe. Uh, we, if the Americans decide to pull out because they say it's just too expensive, um, then Europe has to stand up. And, um, and, and th that will be difficult, because Europe, the Americans are the biggest donors, there's no doubt. But Germany, for example, is the second donor to Ukraine and civilian as, as well as military donor. And we will certainly sustain this level of um, if, if fair peace talks are not, uh, not coming. Now, maybe the president-elect brings Putin to a table and, you know, then a fair peace talk is possible. I don't want to exclude that. That's a possibility. Um, it's a difficult step, and uh, you know you need uh, skills and, and a, a good sense of diplomacy. But if that's the case, tant mieux, as they say in France. So, as I just, just following this uh, this uh, you know uh, conversation about Mr. Trump and his impact on global politics, the other the other element here is of course uh, uh, what we are witnessing in large parts of the world: uh, economic nationalism. Now, uh, in, in some ways. Uh, a secular decline, uh, not only under, under first Trump administration, but also under President Biden. We have not seen the WTO remains uh, as ineffective as ever. We have not seen any serious attempt to revive multilateral uh, institutions uh, in, 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 in terms of trade and commerce. When you look at what is happening around the world, where, where, where this is gaining really salience, uh, how confident are you that uh, economic globalization uh, on which you know i think both uh, countries like germany and india have benefited from uh, how uh, how seriously should we consider uh, should we take its demise and, and whether there is a re-globalization that is happening which is more about blocks which is more about trust-based economic partnerships uh, how do you see that trajectory evolving the german economy is maybe the most globalized economy in the world we live from our global economy. And, you know, I was talking about the German business in India, and you see that um, really growing and flourishing here. And we have 2,200 German companies here, also very small companies, not only the big ships, but also small companies. And, you know, the, 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 the strength and the, 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 you know, the charm of the, of the German business is this, this global mind, you know, that people feel that they are you know, exploring other possibilities and go to India and set up shop even if they have only 200 people here and 300 in Germany or something. But these are not good times for globalized economies. It's very obvious. Now, President Trump is, has a clearly a very protectionist 
approach to things. He wants to impose uh, tariffs on many, many imports from abroad, including Indian imports, um, Chinese imports, uh, German imports uh, in a way also, but as German business is also very present in the US, we don't fear, um, let's say, for example, German car makers. Every German car that is sold in the US is also made in the US, so that's that's not a, such a problem. But so we have a clearly protectionist, nationalist protectionist approach on the American side. I think there we have to take that into consideration. At the same time, we have in China um, 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 a, a hub of the globalized economy also a protectionist streak where the government starts to, um, you know, we feel subsidized illegitimately, uh, illegitimately um, Chinese productions over capacity um, so that, you know, the world market is all of a sudden flooded with Chinese goods. Um, um, and, um, and that leads to a, you know, we thinking or we reflection on how to deal with this country. Now, um, when you come from a globalized economy like Germany does, for example, some cars of Volkswagen or Mercedes that are sold in Germany come from China. Now, when because they are built in China by Volkswagen or Mercedes. Now, when the European Commission now will put trades and tar tariffs on on Chinese produced cars, ironically enough, it would also hit German car makers in China. So. Um, a Golf, uh, Volkswagen Golf car made in China would be much more expensive than a Volkswagen Golf car made in Germany. But, you know, with these international chains, um, there is also a lot of cars from China coming to Europe. So that is for us a problem. And that's, you see, that the German economy is stagnating somehow. We have had, a, in the last um, quarter, we had a slight growth, but, um, you know, it's 0.3% or something. It's very slow, very low. Um, so that, that's a big problem for a globalized economy. I think um, Europe will fight for, um, for a fair globalization. Europe, uh, Europe has been very active on the world markets, not only Germany, but also other nations like the Netherlands or France. So we will try to you know, keep the markets open as much as we can. But what we don't accept, and that is you know, as the trade policy is shaped by the European Union and not by the member states, what, we, not, what we'll, we will not accept is illegitimate subsidies, and that's our China problem. And it may be also, you know, a problem with the U.S. at some stage. If tariffs are put on goods from Europe, um, the European Union will react and also put tariffs on goods from the U.S. And that's a very unfortunate um, development, I would say, if it comes that far. So... Um, the fact is that the U.S. economy is doing quite well. You know, I mean, this is not bad. I mean, the U.S. is having a good. I mean, President Biden, you know, he succeeded in getting the economy with some protectionist measures, as you rightly say, really on a good track after the pandemic, better than ours. But I think President Trump is pretty convinced that uh, the world is fooling the U.S. somehow, and and I think he will react to that, and that will be will be problematic. For us, we, we would like to, you know, open up markets um, internationally and try to get international trade going. But it's, you know, it was 10 years ago, it was easier than it is now. Excuse me, sir. Could you take one question on this, please? I, I, I will. I will come to. I will come Thanks. to. Thanks. Uh, Ambassador, before I open this up, uh, one final question from my side. Perhaps uh, it would be useful for some some in the audience to uh, to also know uh, about German domestic politics uh, because we, there have been some concerns about the rise of the far right. Uh, there are areas in Germany, and there are you know they have had a big success um, earlier this year. So how do you see the domestic politics evolving in Germany because it has direct implications for immigration issues, etc. And of course also for uh, for the larger economic. Uh, questions and German foreign policy. So, so if you can just... Yeah. Really it's a very important topic. Um, um, there is a far-right party in Germany, which is pretty far-right, I must say. You know, you have all sorts of far-right policies in Europe, and there is... It's, it, it sounds ridiculous, but there is a moderate far-right, and there is a right far-right, and the German um, far-right party is certainly a right far-right party. And it has quite a lot of success in Eastern Germany. So um, Germany, like India, is a federal state. And like India, we have all times, we have some state election coming up, which makes our political life a little 
juicy. You know, um, there's always to something to speculate about and to assess about. And this year, this year we had three so far three elections in three East German states, and in all the three East German states, the far right did tremendously well. We about 30-ish percent, I would say. So a third, almost a third of the voters voted for this party. In two states, Saxony and uh, Brandenburg, um, other parties got stronger than the far right. That's also remarkable. But in one state, the Ringia, they were basically they ended up the strongest party. Now, um, that is not reflecting the average um, of the nation. So I think we have to, as, it, as of now, we have to see we will expect about 15 to 16 percent nationwide for this right-wing party. That's still a lot for the in the German Bundestag, in the German Parliament, Lok Sabha, as it were. Um, but it is not decisive. So, um, like in the last two uh, ten years of the governments, there will be a, a very loud opposition, but not decisive. In these East German legislative assemblies, though. This party is now a, a huge factor. No? I mean, if you have, it's either the first or the second uh, parliamentary group in the in the parliament. And so far, we have this firewall where you know everybody says we try to form a coalition with every party except them. Um, and so far, that works. Um, we will see. There is still a lot to do with the government forming in the in two of the three states, one one is done, but two of the three states, they haven't found a, a government yet. But I think the firewall still stands. But the question is, will it stand forever? I don't think that this far right thing will be, a party will be very um, strong on a national level in the next elections. We don't know, you know, in four years time, the world is such a crazy place right now, I would not commit uh, to, to, you know, foreseeing what happens in, in um, in 2029, but in 2025, I think we can be sure that they will not be a major power in the German in the German Parliament. Um, but I would say it reflects. You know, Germany is because of our past very sensitive um, when it comes to far right parties. Um, unlike, for example, our Dutch neighbors or you know Sweden or Finland, where these far right parties are part of the government. Um, uh, or in Italy, no, where they are basically forming the government. Uh, but we have a bit of a you know, moral uh, problem with them. And um, as they are, as I said, very far right, not a moderate far right, but very far right, um, there is still this, this feeling that one should not play with them, basically. Whether that can be upheld for the, for the next couple of years, I, I would not dare to say. Um, it is clear that Trump's election will boost them. Yeah? It's basically their candidate. They feel this nationalistic, protectionist, anti-immigration policy is very, very matching their, very much matching their their ideas. But let me let me say one thing, and even the far right sees that you know Germany has a demographic problem. It's not you know, like China or Korea or, or even Spain is worse. But we need, if we want to keep our level of prosperity, we need skilled labor, and therefore this government has come up with this migration law, which is maybe one of the most liberal migration law of the world right now. So um, on the one hand, you have a, a population that um, is very skeptical of, about illegal migration, asylum seekers, refugees coming from all over the world. On the other hand, basically, everybody knows that you need uh, people who, you know, look after the old people in retirement homes or in after sick people in the hospitals or IT engineers or even bus drivers, you know, everybody, everything is needed. And um, that, that's an interesting factor. I think that people distinguish more or less between these two forms of migration, but they also mix them up once in a while. So you have to walk this very narrow, narrow line that you have to say, we need legal and fair migration. That's what we do with India big time. But we have to fight also illegal migration because the population feels overwhelmed. Interesting enough, is in the states where there is the smallest amount of uh, foreigners migration, the far right has the biggest share. So basically, in the states where there is, you know, we have uh, cities like Frankfurt or something where almost 50 percent of the population has no German passport. 50 percent, and it's, it's enormous. Huh? But there, the far right is not that big. It's interesting. You have the far right in areas 
that are not so much exposed to foreigners. So it's an, an angst, is the, to use the German word, the nice German word, that is basically theoretical rather than practical. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Your questions, comments, observations. Please, uh, please, uh, please be very brief and uh, introduce yourselves and just ask the pointed question yeah, if yeah. you have. One. See, I've got two questions. Whether you can allow me two questions, otherwise one is enough. You see, my name is uh, Professor Doctor Prakash Gupta. I'm into the diplomacy and international relations. Now, we, you were just discussing on the Trump. You see, uh, I've got one uh, to the Excellency. Some say that the Trump is the real Trump for America. The Trump will be the real Trump card for America. What do you see on this statement? Some say in America that Trump will be the real Trump card for America, for the US, on the second term. And second term, second question is, on the India-Germany business relations, uh, what is the progress going on in the green energy? I mean, the electric vehicles and the you know semiconductors, manufacturing, and you know, on your first question, critical, let me say that it's I'm not I'm not you know if I'm not an American citizen, I didn't vote in America. What I can say is they voted for Donald Trump. That means that in a, in a very very strong way, they that means that many Americans feel that he should be the, the their president, and you know everybody has to accept that, including me, and and I do. So is it a Trump card? Is it not a Trump card? remains to be seen, you know, um, but the fact is that many, many people voted for him for whatever reasons. Um, they, they knew what way they, they would get because the last time they voted for him, they didn't know, but now they know because there was a four-year Trump term. So I think, you know, I'm not commenting on whether he will be a good president or a bad president, I don't know, but I accept the fact that they voted for him and he's the, now the, the legitimate president-elect of the United States of America. When it comes to the to the um, sustainability aspect, um, there is a lot of engagement both from the government as well as from the private sector in renewables when it comes to um, in your German business relations. So in renewables are big. We have a lot of German investment in renewables here in India, and we have um, groups where private sector and government comes together um, in uh, you know energy an energy working group where we uh, try to figure out how to increase um, our investment and our support for renewables in India and. The most interesting of these undergroups is the hydrogen group. We have a, a group on green hydrogen because Germany feels that in the future um, India, India might turn into an energy exporter and um, export green hydrogen amongst others to Germany. Um, and that is for us a very interesting perspective. Max Muller never came to India and he has written a lot about Indian culture, spiritual things and other things. And you have been here for a second term, I think. And you have been enjoying Indian mangoes very much. Do you think, are you planning to have write some book on mangoes to promote business? And second thing is that about Indo-China and German-China relationship. This is just a very flip side for both sides. And you are very good in auto industry. Now you have lost that edge also. Why not to have a collaboration in semiconductor to encourage this type of technology? Thank you. Mango thing, you know, what? <laughs> I'm, I'm on. Nobody waits for my mango book, actually. Frankly, I mean, this is uh, would be uh, completely uh, uh, inappropriate. I would say, you know, I like mangoes. That's not good enough to write a book. But what I do um, is um, what we do. The jam, not I do. We do is we run a program, very interesting program, with cooperatives in Uttar Pradesh, um, mango cooperatives to export mangoes to the European Union. Now, that's very, very complicated because um, the phytosanitarian um, standards are very high. And you have to, from the you know, growth of the mango, from the very first moment, you have to keep that in consideration. So we ran a, a project together with um, a very, very good mango um, uh, you know, uh, cultivating state agency in, near Lucknow, where, where we um, tried to you know, teach farmers, small farmers, these feet to to respect this, the European phytosanitarian um, you know standards, and that led you know last year, last summer, this summer, sorry, this summer, for the first time to a big um, you know uh, amount of uh, mango exports to the European Union for the first time ever. Um, Uttar Pradesh mangoes came to, which are arguably I don't know, some might agree, some might not agree, but I think. 
Uta Breishman, who are amongst the best, let's put it diplomatically. So basically, <laughs> um, um, uh, that that um, is is a is a big step forward, and these cooperative farmers are very happy about it because they get way more money for these mangoes than selling them here on the market. And I think basically that's more useful than writing a book on the. Um, on the semiconductor, uh, we will sit to go down with India in many, many fora on discuss co cooperation on semiconductors. You know, Germany is very keen on talking about strategic autonomy to getting a part of the, um, you know, semiconductor production to Europe. Most of them come from Taiwan right now, no? but but we, we feel that, you know, for security and, you know, for, for the future, it's better to have you know, them on sitting on, on, on different uh, legs or, or pillars, and therefore there will be the huge uh, uh, semiconductor uh, production site in Germany now, in Dresden. And, um, and we feel that the Indian uh, you know, government thinks along the same lines, and therefore we will sit together and compare notes. Can we go back? Good afternoon. I'm Harini. I'm a consultant from the Ministry of External Affairs. Uh, my question is regarding the energy crisis that Europe faced uh, last year and the year before. Uh, what is the status of energy management in Germany right now? And what are we looking at? How is this winter for Europe? Wonderful answer to this question. I'm very happy to answer because we had huge energy crisis. Speaking on putting all your eggs in one basket, our eggs were in the Russian basket and basically 50% of our energy came from Russia. And we had to switch that from one day to the other to 0%. So basically we had a, a, a gap of 50% of our energy was gone from one day to the other, which was a political decision, of course. Um, the government succeeded in getting in very, very little time complete um, you know, filling through other sources. That's European sources, but also Gulf sources. So basically we had a, a very, very quickly, we had a new energy mix from different sources coming together so that never in Germany we had really shortages of energy. Now, but what happened was that during the you know, first month of the Ukraine crisis, energy prices went through the roof. And that was one of the big problems the German economy had to shoulder was that you know all of a sudden energy prices that are already relatively high in Germany, just doubled or something. So it was very, very expensive. Also for the end consumer, so basically the household who had to, you know, unlike India, um, heat in the winter and, and, and needed energy. Now, the price has come down to lower than before the, um, uh, the, the, the Ukraine crisis. That's very good news. So we have... Um, we, have, we are at a lower price than before the Ukraine crisis. How did we get there? As I said, um, through very different sources, but there's one factor which, and I said never waste a crisis at the beginning, one factor that contributed to it was the massive expansion of renewable energy in Germany, wind and sun. And now I think it's almost 60% of our electricity coming from uh, renewables. And, you know, the Ukraine crisis really pushed us hard in in getting there. And, and this is something where, you know, I feel uh, the Ukraine crisis has done a lot for, for, for more, more sustainability in Germany and also independence, energy independence of Germany. We will see more of that. Um, and I mentioned green hydrogen, where we feel that, you know, this might be a very, very interesting source of energy. We will produce some of them on our own soil, but some of them has to come, uh, some of it has to come from abroad, and India is a good partner. My name is Rajiv Sinha, and I'm a distinguished fellow here at the ORF. I had a question for you on uh, NATO. We were discussing about President Trump's victory and uh, the very fact that he has a transnational approach and he has a different view on how NATO should work and how the European Union itself and European countries should pay more for the maintenance and upkeep of NATO. Uh, now, as you mentioned, uh, it's an it's a agglomeration of 27 countries, big and small. Some may be able to meet the new 3%, as we just talked about. Some countries may not be able to meet it. So the point is, if the Americans reduce their commitment because some countries can't meet it, will NATO continue the way it is? Will Europe get together and ensure the continuity of NATO? That's the first question. And the second question was about the fair piece you talked about Ukraine. Now, if the Americans do get to do science to talk, and uh, will the definition of fair negotiations 
stand in the way of accepting that American proposal, or will Europe take a different view to the crisis? In the question first, it's easy to be answered. What is a fair peace has to be decided by Ukraine. It has to be decided by them. If the Ukrainian government says, these are conditions under which we are ready to sit at a table and negotiate some peace agreement that might even include some you know, rearrangement of territory or something, then it's a fair um, peace. But it's not up to the Russians or not up to the Americans or up to us to say whether it's a fair peace, it's up to the Ukrainians. Ukraine, I mean, you should not forget, you know, in all the longing for peace, a small country has been invaded by a big, very powerful country, uh, and 20% of its territory was grabbed by a country that is relatively large, one has to say. So one wonders why they want this territory, but okay. So there is a victim and an aggressor here, you know, and it is up to the victim to decide whether peace negotiations are fair or not. I, I think that President Zelensky made it clear that he is ready to negotiate uh, um, under, if the circumstances are right. And, and that, I think, should be our measurement, and what is fair and what is not. When it comes to NATO, you might remember that NATO has, an unknown, has gotten an unknown popularity because of Russia. You know, um, uh, there was a time about a couple of years ago where President Macron said the NATO is brain dead. The NATO is very alive through because of Russia. It was very calm and uh, a little suffering, I would say. But Russia, Russians um, have have made NATO very attractive, and uh, it. Uh, you might remember it got two new members, and the two new members are Sweden and Finland. And I can tell you what, I would have never thought in my lifetime that these two countries would join a military alliance yeah, because they had uh, said that. Um, uh, Eternal neutrality is what they what they want. Now in Austria they are discussing NATO membership. I don't think that this is coming soon. But uh, you know, all of a sudden, all these countries are interesting. So everybody feels now threatened by by Russia in Europe. I think there is no doubt. Everybody feels threatened, and NATO for them is a framework, an umbrella under which people feel safer. So that, in a consequence, makes it very probable that even if President Trump um, uh, is dismissive about NATO and the cost the U.S. have to pay for it, um, it is very um, likely that NATO will play an important role in Europe um, after that too. So there's always the fear that President Trump would leave NATO. I don't think that will be the case because the parliament has to, you know, accept that and it's in, in the Congress in the US has to accept that there is a law that says you can't just leave NATO. So it's, it's very difficult for him to leave NATO. But you leaving NATO is the ultimate step. You can, you know, say I, you know, reduce my contribution to NATO, which would be harsh for NATO because US are the biggest contributor. But would that lead to a failure of NATO? The answer is no. Yeah. Ambassador, if you allow me, I can yeah. take a few questions. To yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Uh, greetings, Your Excellency, and greetings, uh, Mr. Pant. My question is regarding Germany's stance on China. As we recently saw in Momagao, the German frigate and the replenishment ship were there, and then they went through the Taiwan Strait. Uh, this comes uh, despite the saber rattling and warning by China. So, is Germany willing to conduct more such military actry in the Taiwan Strait and uh, uh, in the South China Sea, despite the Chinese threatening and warnings? Mm -hmm. Ambassador, my name is uh, Madhavendra Singh, and the question is on defense and strategic partnership. Uh, so Germany has indicated a shift toward uh, deeper defense cooperation with India, uh, including potential joint efforts in defense manufacturing, next generation submarines. What are the current challenges and opportunities in bolstering this partnership, especially in terms of reducing India's uh, reliance on other defense suppliers? Mm. Excellency, my name is Udra Akshinija. I'm the founder of GeoJurist today. Uh, my question is, how does Germany seek to make its presence uh, in the Indian military hardware? Does Spain's presence concern you, especially after the C-295 aircraft deal? How is Germany planning to execute itself in India's P-75 naval submarine, which is the diesel-powered submarine project? Excellency, uh, in the recent visit, uh, one mutual legal assistance treaty has been signed. Mm -hmm. Now, do you see this in the presence of extradition treaty, which was signed in 2001? What is the prospective intent with respect to this? And how do you see the now the infiltration of North Korean army in the mm. Ukraine? Mm. Uh, is, if I may use that word, is Germany ready for it? For North Korea? <laughs> who, is not, who is ready for North Korea? You know? 
Trump thought he was ready for North Korea, but as you remember, he was not very successful either. So um, on Ch China, very uh, quickly, um, yes, we are continuing our, our military presence in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I, I think that we, you'll see regularly um, German Air Force and Navy coming to the region. Um, we have been very, very um, present over the last years, not only in India, but also in, the, in Southeast Asia and Australia, and, and, and that will continue. So I think there's, we have Indo-Pacific guidelines by the German government, and they basically tell very clearly that Germany will continue. On the submarines, maybe the two questions together because they are um, similar. No, I mean, this is a tender by the Indian government. Um, the Indian government um, has um, you know, tried, or there was a trial for both um, submarine systems. One is Spanish, one is German. Um, the Marine, the Navy, navies, the, the, Navy, the Indian Navy has um, made it very clear that they have preference for one system. I'll not mention which one, but you might guess. Um, the Indian government has not taken a decision yet. That's completely fine. You know, I mean, this is some, some th that's how it goes. You know, you have to wait until the Indian government takes the decision. We are waiting patiently. I have to say, though, that the German government has made it very clear that they are fully behind this um, deal and that they are also ready to sign a government-to-government -government agreement, which is unique. We have never done that before, but we feel that, you know, in the, in the framework of our renewed um, commitment to become a stable and reliable security partner for India, that G2G government uh, agreement would be necessary and helpful. And therefore, um, you know, we have discussed on how, how such an uh, agreement could look like, and we are ready to, if need be, or if, if the time comes to, to sit down. We are not worried about Spain. First of all, Spain is a good friend of Germany. We are very close partners in the European Union. We love Spain. I mean, Half of Germany is in Spain basically most of the time because the weather is better than in Germany. But um, you should not forget that the aircraft deal is a deal that is called by a company called Airbus. And Airbus is 11% of Airbus is owned by the German government. So the Airbus deal with Spain, it's indeed an, an Airbus factory in, in Spain that you know produces this, this transport aircraft you were referring to. Um, but it's also it's a good thing for us also. No? It's, a, it's, it's France, Germany, Spain, and, and the rest of the shares are on the market. Um, so basically, uh, we were very happy to see the Prime Minister, uh, the Prime Minister of Spain, Presidente Sanchez, coming here to, to Gujarat and inaugurating this, this uh, because it's also good for us. What are the challenges? I can tell you um, the biggest challenge is um, price. <laughs> India is a very price-sensitive country, you know. Um, uh, you know that on you know that on every level. So um, um, you know stuff from Europe is not for nothing. You know, Muftni. You know, it's um, <laughs> <laughs> you have to you have to um, you put some money on the table in order to get good pro pro product. No? So that's a big challenge. And then, as always, the challenge of technology transfer. But you have seen that we have also signed a. Um, uh, an agreement on the ex on confidentiality, a confidentiality protection agreement, and that is helpful for this uh, technology. Substance. Now, on the uh, mutual legal uh, assistance um, a treaty, this is a, a thing that is, was in the pipeline for a long time. Now, this is, I think, going a step further. That means that you know both countries are in mutual respects um, uh, easing help easing support um, for one another if it comes to, um, to you know, criminal affairs or others that need this support. It's an important, it's, it sounds very technical, but for us it's a very important um, uh, uh, treaty. I think it, it, for us it's a, an agreement that helps in many ways um, to, in a, in a, you know, we have a growing Indian diaspora we have a growing, uh, we, we talked about globalized economy, and we have growing Indian investment in Germany. So India and Germany are growing together. We have 50,000 Indian students in Germany. I didn't mention that. That's, we are very proud of that. It's, it's a great, it's the biggest non-German group in, of students. And so in, in, this, in this context where the societies move together, such, a, such an agreement is very helpful, I would say. So um, we consider that a big step forward. Uh, hello, my name is Harish Thakur. Uh, I'm from first year Hindu college. Uh, I have a few set of questions. Uh, firstly, my question is about the EU carbon tax because uh, FM uh, Nirmala Sitaraman said that this tax is 
unilateral arbitrary and is hurting india's exports so what is cbm cbm so what is uh, germany's take on this uh, mm. and secondly uh, in september this year a uh, islamic center was closed in germany wherein ties were found with hezbollah and hamas mm. to the center and in austria in the very same week about 72 people were arrested with uh, islamic extremism mm. and connecting this with the rise of the afd is is this something like that is extremism is driving voters towards far right due mm. to which uh, migrant uh, bans are supposedly in place so what do, what is your take on this and yeah. what can be the preventive measures yes, in this sir. regard yes. uh, ambassador it's always pleasure to listen to you my name is dr vishnu uh, we met in i am from indo germany young leaders forum uh, ambassador as you have worked in india and before so when you say and when professor pan said indo german relation looks sexy i feel proud that we worked for it you have also worked for the in first but the moment you say china and it looks like it's like a rebound you know the first love did not work so india might be a rebound now so mm. can't we say a narrative to change it so it should give us also a pla- you know kind of satisfaction that we are india is also important we work for it and that's the reason indo german relation is thriving now not only i know you you always speak right. your heart china is always there yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but if we set a narrative yeah. like this yeah, yeah, yeah. probably the germans will always take the narrative like that Uh, and and one small uh, to add to when we talking about skill movement which we are talking about when the afd is increasing the eastern part uh, and the migration the skilled workers are needed so all the indian should only focus on the, the others mm. or it's yeah, still okay that's also outside. a good question mm. oh, good afternoon ambassador ish hai she tanishk and ish come out new delhi very good all right uh, so my question is like how germans and like German government in general looks at India's stance on the war at Gaza. In the war at Gaza. In Gaza. I'm Deepak Sharma, a student at University of Delhi. So I have two questions. So first, as you mentioned already, that the German economy is German economy is most globalized in the world, and uh, in the wake of Russia Ukraine war, we are seeing that the rise of economic nationalism all over the world. So how does the German government plans to adapt to these uh, circumstances of the changing economic order in the world? and so second about the submarine deal sir the previously the german company which was about to be part of the project 75y of the indian navy it had backed out of the deal but it only after the backing by the german government did it participate in the uh, the the tender so what does the german government's expect uh, expectations are from this defense cooperation with india so this is the submarine see but you will be surprised to see you know that there is a big gap into what the indian government says and what indian private sector says um when we talk to indian companies they don't uh, mind the cbm at all uh, um so um there is a, something in india which i find very interesting namely that the government in many ways is very traditional in arguing you know also in the fora like um cop for example um whereas what happens on the ground is very different so basically the cbm is when we talk to business here they don't see it as such a problem the the government is more um, you know hostile to it but the the people who have to deal with it are less less uh, hostile and then the islamic center that's an interesting question i i think that um you know germany took a lot of muslim refugees during 2015 2016 mostly from syria but also from afghanistan and iraq um th- that was basically one reason why the far right uh, became so strong this islamic center has nothing to do with it it's a is iranian islamic center it's a shia islamic center and it was there for a long long time and um you know our relations with iran have deteriorated big time over the last couple of months and that included the, the closure of the center because we felt that the center is basically a spy uh, you know organization for the Ir- iranian republic um and 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 you know it took us it's very difficult for us to close religious institutions because religion has a very strong role in our constitution and we feel that freedom of religion is a very very um you know it's sacrosanct in a way but in this case i think the government took the step because they had enough proofs to um to see um that there was there was involvement by the iranian government i have to say at the end of the day um Uh, you know the more you get people in from you know different and uh, cultures and civilizations the more um, people who are maybe not that young anymore feel threatened yeah? and that's also a phenomenon in america you see the same uh, phenomenon in america so uh, it is certainly an 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 a factor in the in the development of the far right but you have to see also that we need these people you know there is no doubt that 
we our labor market is so, so we have a, our economy you mentioned it is stagnating is is growing very slowly but uh, we have no unemployment problem very strangely you know we have an, we have too many vacancies that's one of the reason why the economy is also strong so there is this titter of that and then um china now let me say uh, you know we I, I understand that you are a little hurt, but what I say is, what I said, and I think I want to repeat myself, I started by saying um, business is looking towards India in a new framework and in a, under new circumstances. And I mentioned the Deutsche Bank and then mentioned uh, SAP. 2,200 companies already in India are making good money for, for, for a long, long time. And then I said, why are now even more companies looking towards India is because of China. Now, this is one single reason, sorry to say, we love India, okay? Can you consider, we think it's a great country. We have relations with India since long, long time. We have very, very strong and very deep relations in the academic world. So I would say our relations with India have nothing to do with China, nothing. But now with the de-risking cup, you see more business coming to India. That should satisfy you. I think that can be said. Um, and then um, the, the question on Gaza, this is a very, very different question for Germans. And um, uh, when you follow the German debate, it's a very, very harsh and not very pleasant debate. There is, Germany is very divided. You know, there is a very, mostly young people are very, very, siding very much with Palestinians in this war, also with Lebanese people. And, um, there is media, but also politicians who feel the very strong responsibility Germany has towards Israel leads to, um, um, or should lead to more of uh, understanding and, 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 and more support of what is Israel does in, the, in, the, in, the, in Gaza and in, in Lebanon. But the government said at the same time, very, very strongly, time and again, you know, that we are very uncomfortable with, with the way Israel uses its right to self-defense. Uh, um, when you see the terrible humanitarian impact in Gaza, and you know, 42,000 people are dead in Lebanon, or 3,000 people are dead, that's also something where there is a great concern, and the government also underlines that. At the same time, you will understand that Germany, with its particular past, feels a very, very strong solidarity with Israel, and feels that Israel was attacked like um, it was never before on 7th October last year. And therefore, our solidarity is with the people of Israel in, in many ways. And we always underline that Israel also had the right of self-defense. It's a very narrow line to walk on. And it's very, very difficult to, um, to, uh, to find the right, uh, the right argument here in, in between these two sides. And I feel that the German debate is it's a, it's a very harsh debate right now. It's uh, you know basically an, a non-conciliatory debate. When you see universities being very, very pro-Palestinian, and then you, know, you have many people who say Hamas is basically part of the left movement of the world. I don't know how that comes to, you know, to mind. If Hamas is a terrorist organization, you should not put them as a liberation movement. You know? But at the same time, what happens in Gaza is really also heartbreaking. You, know, what you see what Israel does. And so it's very difficult to find the right. Uh, in Germany, it's very difficult to find the right. Uh, so the last question was on the submarines again, no? was it? Um, so the tender, yeah, I, you, you wanted, I mean, we, we, the, the, the tender, the government supported the tender and our government supports the joint venture between TKMS and MDL, Mazagao. And um, that also helped, of course, to, um, you know, put stuff on the table because um, both companies felt encouraged by that. Um, I think that the government, the German government, and its clear support for this matter, was a big step in, you know, submitting the offer from from from. But you know, whether the Indian government will decide in its favor or not, it has nothing to do with uh, with with the government support. It will be, you know, they're weighing the options and they will see what 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 vehicle they really need or what what uh, submarine they really need. And and um, but it's no secret that. We do hope that they will decide for the German. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for, for joining us uh, this afternoon. And I know how busy you have been. Uh, he, he just came directly from the airport because he was traveling to Bombay, Mumbai, and, Bang uh, and Bangalore. So thank you uh, again. And I think a lot of what this conversation revealed is how, uh, how India-German relations stand at a very, very interesting moment and how they have been transformed both by the government to government ties, but also something that he mentioned, uh, the number of students now going to Germany and studying. So, so both the trends bottom up and top down are working at the same time. And hopefully that, that will, this, this trend will continue and we'll continue to have you over uh, a few more times uh, before you leave India. But thank you so much for, for joining us this afternoon. Please join us for tea and, and a big round of applause for the ambassador.